the mic. Well, welcome to all. I hope all the speakers are here. Uh, this is the story time. This is the time that you hear the stories that uh, are told at the dinner table when people are, are gathering with their relatives. And so it's the, the oral history of the people of this area, the Swedes of this area. So the first to speak will be Carol Cookie. Cookie Whips, you're not hearing me? Okay, how's that? All right, uh, Carol, Cookie? Right here. Yeah, Cookie's going to have a couple of stories to tell us. Yeah. Which one? Can you use that one? Please? Oh, we can? You yeah. use this one. Ah, uh, sounds like you hear me. Welcome, all of you. So nice to be here. Good dog, good dog. I um, kind of got uh, into this last summer. I had a special birthday, and Sonia was down from Winnipeg, and my neighbors planned uh, this surprise party. And it was a Swedish theme, and Sonia was there rowing her regalia, and she said, we're going to have a big Swedish day here next year. And I didn't hear anything for a while, and then all of a sudden, book a hall, cooking, book a hall. So I started thinking about where could we be outdoors and inside, and I thought about this hall, because it was certainly a Scandinavian settlement many years ago. So here we are. It came into being, so... Let's get going. And um, I'm actually doing, um, my dad was an immigrant, so I'm going to be talking about him. And I'm also talking about Lakeside, because that's Swede Town. So bear with me. They said five minutes, but I said, yeah, but I've got really two stories. So anyway, I'll talk really fast. Okay, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> it's really heartwarming to have so many here today to enjoy coming together to share our passion and love for our Swedish culture and ancestry. We're very proud of our heritage and our love for our families and for others strengthens our bonds and links us together. Life is about sharing and the special memories and stories that are shared enriches all of us. Now we'll get started. I'm going to be starting right my dear dad, Eric Reynold Wicks, grew up in Ursa. He was called Usha because that's where he came from. It was a small community in Dalarna, that's the province of Sweden. And that's why we have that nice big horse. So when you mentioned having the horse, and I said, ha, ha, ha. I thought it was a big wooden. I always saw this years ago when we went up to Winnipeg, so I thought it was wooden. But it's, well, it's heavy. It's fiberglass, but... <laughs> It was on the road, and yesterday when, when she sent me a picture of it coming, I had tears in my eyes. I thought, oh, it's coming. It really is coming. Anyway, Wix is the name of our property name. And so he would have been called, Dad would have been called Eric Carl's son, as his father was Carl. I would have been called Carol. Well, that's my real name, Carol Cookie, Eric's daughter. Confusing? Well, that's why Wix, that's why they took the property name. And uh, when Mom and I were in Sweden, there was a street called Bix's Vag. So we stood quite proudly in just a little village, but there's our name right there in the property. Dad emigrated to Canada in his teens. He came by boat to Halifax. He had no English, and he told me, he pointed at the pastries in a bakery and had pot for a couple of weeks because he had no language and it was shy and embarrassed. Anyway, his brother came too for a year, but he decided to go back. Dad had a strong work ethic and worked in bush camps using sweet saws, road construction, mines, bridges, and on the railway. He worked long days of this hard work. The immigrants were often teased and made fun of because of their language barrier. He told me about one of the bosses being mean to the horses, and Dad told him he better stop and be kinder. And anyway, he says, well, then you're fired. And he walked the tracks 30 miles to White River and had frozen hands and feet. And the doctor took him in and looked after him until he was well again to go on to the next job. And so he moved around finding work and worked in all the provinces. One construction job was working in the Bank of Montreal in Ottawa. And someone blew out the windows at the Parliament building too strong a shot. Anyway, during the war, he, he was flown to Nova Scotia to help build the runways. 
always uh, had a good eye for level, what should be level. Road construction was an area he loved, and he worked for Joe Vaughn Construction Outfit. Bobby Vaughn's here today, and they built the road to Red Lake. Sonia, Sonia actually said, yeah, she was one of the first cars to come down that road. He was married to Mama in 1945, and she drove supplies in an old truck that didn't even have doors. Our area reminded Dad of Sweden with the trees, lakes, and rocks, and he chose to settle here. Of course, another reason was he married Mum, who was the first woman to work at the Royal Bank in Kuwaitan. Dad started working for the Department of Highways of Ontario and loved his work, became a patrol supervisor, and Toronto used to send the young engineers here to learn from those with years of experience. They settled in Lakeside, Sweet Town, as it was called. Mum was an only child. Her mother, Anna Monk, was born in northern Sweden on the, the border of Sweden and Norway, and her dad, Dan, was born right in Surly, Norway. They came to Canada to settle as they had relatives in Muriel Lake, Christine and John Lund. Mum spoke Norwegian and Swedish as her first language and learned English playing with the youngsters outdoors. She grew up at Chicken Point, moved to Ottawa Street, corner, Kitty Corner to Powell's Garage, who wasn't too far for her to walk to school. John Lund delivered mail to Muriel Lake and would come to Kuwait in the winter across the frozen lakes with horse and cutter, pick up Mum and her mum, take them back to Muriel Lake. They placed her down low in the cutter to keep her warm. The horse's tail used to swish her in the face, she said. I loved hearing stories and only wished I had recorded all of them. Sundays were a day to go for a ride around the Lacklu Loop. We'd visit the Lunds, Edison's, Pearson's, Hedman's and visit their summer kitchens. Lots of stories and lots of fun. It was a dusty road, not like the well-paved roads today. Had to keep the car windows closed. Very hot drive. Once we hit the Trans-Canada, windows came down and we could whew, say we're okay again. Lakeside was a little community town within the town. So there were businesses, stores, churches, the Bethesda Lutheran Church. The cornerstone was laid in 1894. Lots of Swedes, and Sweden was the first language that they used. Lakeside Baptist Church, 6th Street Corner, and South Ward School and King George School. Growing up there was my world, and we had what we needed around us. I'll tell you about some of the known businesses now. Love Strauss Bakery. Oh, the aroma of the fresh buns and their pastries. And I love their cream puffs. Just They always had them in the window, and Kathy Johnson just told me the other day, they had single pane windows, so in the window, they kept fresh. They didn't spoil. I didn't know that until she told me. I remember when I was a youngster at South Ward School, and one of the mothers used to go to the bakery, and Aunt Reese's come and give her little guy baking, and the rest of us were like, endless, of course. <laughs> didn't get any, but we had our share anyway. Bob Green's Lakeside Confectionery on 6th and Pearl were there. And we'd go there with a bottle worth two cents and gaze at all the penny candy and decide what could we have. Oh, you can't see that. <laughs> Alex Wickstrom's, Rolly Wickstrom's, Raymond's Right Spot, Ellie Bond, uh, forward information on her family. So I'm taking up her time now. S.P. Olson Construction Crew <laughs> did the blasting on the railway tunnel. And he and his wife, Marta, ran the Temperance Hall. Albert Olson had the Coke plant and apparently free pop and donuts on Friday. I didn't get in on that one. TV Ole's refrigerator and repair business uh, and Ed Olson's Black, Black's grocery store and all wonderful places and a painter and a decorator. Bamps breweries in Lakeside and they would go and gather labels and make these neat little belts. Don't know how, but we did it. Blue Heron was Hokanson's ice cream parlor and boarding house. My grandmother actually cleaned rooms upstairs. Mum told Jim Johansson about the ice cream parlor the next year he sold ice cream. Before that, uh, Mr. Lindstrom had the fish packing operation and the Holmstroms and Santas were delivering, the, they were the commercial fishermen. There was a sawmill by Lawrence's Creek and it was a swampy place. <laughs> Anything more? <laughs> I had so much more. Thank you very much.
Sophie, that was so interesting. And uh, there are lots of people here who would be glad to hear the rest of this story sometime during the day when you're, when you're visiting around. Uh, next we have the, El the Halverson story, the Halverson journey, pardon me. And uh, it was written by June Kohlbach, who unfortunately couldn't come. Uh, Rhonda Halverson is uh, going to read her story. Rhonda? Thank you. So hello, my name is Rhonda Halverson. I am the daughter of William Halverson, who lives in Rainy River, and he is 92 years old. My cousin June Halverson was originally planning on sharing this account with you herself. However, due to family matters that arose, she could not make it, so I'll read it for her. Our great-grandparents were both born in Dalarna, Sweden. Daniel was born in 1864 to Helford and Sophie Anderson. As it was the Swedish custom, custom for the firstborn son to take his father's first name and add son, that would become his last name, Helfordson. Over the years, Daniel changed letters where the name became Holverson. Daniel married Anna Majorklin in 1887. In 1905, along with seven children, they immigrated to Canada. They settled at Deception, which is now known as Lac Blue. Daniel soon found work on the double track line for CNR as a blacksmith, a trade he learned in Sweden. After their daughter Elsa was born in Kenora, they moved to Tyndall, Manitoba for more blacksmith work. The last child born to Daniel and Anna was Arnold. He was the 11th child. From there, the family moved to Berglund, Ontario. In 1912, Daniel and oldest son Ben left the family to work tunnel jobs at Mount Robson near Jasper. It was a five-year project. Upon returning home, great-granddad Daniel built himself a sawmill. It's been said that some of the steel that went into building it was from bits and pieces that had fallen onto the floor from his job as a blacksmith. He was now in the lumber business. Son Ben married Anna Holmes Holmgren, who was from Berglund. He worked in Nestor Falls area at guiding and blacksmithing, and he had learned from his father Dan, as he had learned from his, Don, from his father Daniel. Also, he worked on road construction as a, as a road was being built north towards Nestor Falls. In 1938, Ben and Anna moved to the Nestor Falls area. He built a lodge and two cabins on an island on Lake of the Woods. Eventually, over time, he built a lodge and 12 cabins at Crow Lake, some of which were built out of the logs from the Bergen sawmill. Those were the days of no comfort and services. If you wanted and needed something, you either made it or you went without. The resort is still in operation today. Daniel and Anna's daughter, Annie, married Isidore Larson and later settled at Latlu, at Latlu to raise their family. <clears throat> Eventually, all the children married and moved away, except for my grandpa, Oscar, and Uncle, Dar Uncle Arnold. We give thanks to our great-grandma, Anna Halverson. She was not only a hard-working woman raising 11 children, but when my dad, Selmer, his brother, William, and sister, when June's dad, Selmer, and my dad, William, and sisters, Alice and Selma, lost their mother at a young age, it was this grandma that stepped in to help Oscar raise the children. Of Oscar's four children, only William and Selma remain. And here I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, next is something called Alien Life in Lacloo. And it was written by Barb Schroeder Nansen and her great niece. Cassandra McGowan will be reading it for us. Hi, everyone. Um, my childhood definition of an alien was someone from outer space. Now I have a secret. My grandparents were aliens. I have proof, and I am about to tell you quite an amazing story. When I was a small child, I overheard my parents and, they, and their friends talking, and one of the guests said my grandparents were aliens. For the rest of my childhood, I looked at my grandparents very strangely, and I assumed they really were aliens. And now I have gathered all the evidence I need to prove it to you. First of all, they came to Canada on a ship, well, I presumed a spaceship. 
They came from a faraway land called Sweden. I assumed that Sweden was part of a galaxy. They did not speak our language, but instead spoke some alien tongue called Swedish. They dress differently than we do. They actually wore horns on their heads. And they ate the weirdest food. Head cheese, pork hocks, fish heads, and loot fisks, to name a few. So, yes, they were aliens. And not until I was a teenager did I realize there was another definition of alien, a foreign-born immigrant. By this definition, most of our earliest pioneers were aliens. My grandfather, Otto Schroeder, and his wife, Matilda Torin, came to America in 1908 from Sweden. Otto was born in a small farming community in Haslingland, which is situated in the middle of Sweden on the east coast. Matilda was born in Varmland, along the southwest border of Sweden and Norway. They married on August 22, 1901 in Sweden. The original Schroeder farmstead in Bergter, Sweden, was been owned and farmed by the Schroeder since 1890. And 129 years later, it is still a working farm and owned by my cousin Hans Schroeder. Otto and Matilda, along with almost one-fifth of the population of Sweden, decided to come to America due to famine and no work available. Grandpa Otto and his brother Charlie and Grandma Matilda and her brother Carl with his wife Ruby all journeyed together across the ocean. They first came to Canada in 1908, then went to Duluth, Minnesota in 1909, and then settled in, in Ostersund, Lac Lou in 1912. By the way, they took a ship, not a spaceship, from Malmo, Sweden to New York City. Then from New York, they took the train to Duluth. To get to Canada, they traveled by cart and oxen. Otto and Matilda stayed in Duluth for three years. My dad, Alget Schroeder, was born in Duluth, Minnesota, USA. Yes, you guessed it, another alien on the list. Now, why Ostersund, you ask? First of all, they were offered 120 acre farmsteads for free if they homesteaded there. This area looks like Sweden, bush, trees, lakes, and wildlife. All these reasons contributed to settling in to what is now called Lac Luke. Otto and Matilda's first order of business upon arriving was to build a shelter. For the first year of their life in Lac Lou, they lived in a tent while they built their home on Lake Rosina. They lived there for 42 of the 56 years of their marriage. I had always envisioned a beautiful log home like the ones you see today, but apparently not. It was an unassuming wood frame house. It had a stoop, which are steps leading up to the front door to a small landing, and then you walked into what was called the great room. There was a kitchen table and a wood stove near the front door. Always on the stove was deer meat stewing and Swedish coffee. I called it syrup, brewing to greet you. There was three single beds for their three sons, Alget, Herbert, and Lars, pushed along the sides of the walls, used as couches during the day. And Grandma Matilda had her rocking chair. There was one small bedroom with a curtain for a door, for Matilda and Otto to sleep in. Have you been counting the rooms too? The great room and the bedroom. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> they were fortunate enough to also have a summer kitchen, a lean-to against the house where meals were prepared in the summer heat and where the pickling and the canning was done in the fall. The home had no plumbing, no heat source other than the wood stove and no electricity, just the coal oil lamps. To go to the bathroom, you had to walk 300 yards up the hill and into the bush to the outhouse in the spring, summer, fall, and winter. Matilda insisted it be that far away. They also built a root cellar on the side of the hill by the creek. This underground room kept the potatoes, carrots, turnips cold and fresh. There was a small wooden door to get into, similar to a hobbit door. They also built a nice house, more like a wooden shed of sorts. In the winter, they would cut huge blocks of ice and cover them with sawdust, and then they would have ice all summer long. 
Laundry was brought down to the creek and cleaned on the rocks. The clothes were hung outside to dry, but the sheets were laid out on the fields dry. It was quite the sight to see all the sheets lying in the field, wrestling in the wind like sleeping ghosts. Otto and Matilda did many things to make a living and to survive. They had to clear the land with their team of horses. They worked the farm, selling the eggs from their chickens and the milk from the cows. They would row through Bell Creek and then to Portage to Rice Bay and then row the boat on Lake Lulu to sell their goods to Winnipeg cottagers. Even back then, Manitobans were important to our economy. In the fall, Otto would go west to harvest and Matilda would look after the farm. They even took on a border for almost two years. Mr. Vin Clancy, who many of you would have known, they picked and sold hundreds of pounds of blueberries from Blueberry Hill. Otto built cedar rowboats and sold them around the lake. The boats he did not sell, he would rent out for one dollar a day. Otto also built houses. I guess that's where my dad, Alga, got his love of carpentry from. Using a dog sled in the winter, they would trap beaver and mink, mink to raise cash. When you went to Grandma's house, you would see beaver pelts strung on wood frames and put around the great room just like artwork. Matilda was so proud that they had enough cash to buy a large canoe. One I'm not sure Grandpa liked so much. He seemed to fall out of it a lot. I think he preferred his own rowboats. One more minute. Okay. No. I can stop, and then we can talk later. Yeah. That's okay. Thank you. Sorry, I had actually allowed for that one because... Uh, she sent that story to me quite some time ago. That was the first story that I received. Uh, Emma, thank you, Randy. Appreciate that. Uh, next, we have Wally Gustafson talking about his... Pardon? What about Randy? Oops, sorry. And I'm thanking Randy already. Sorry. Thank you, Cassandra. Next, <laughs> let's try again. Uh, Randy Anderson talking about the Anderson family. Hi, everyone. I want to just start by saying thank you um, to the Swedish Cultural Society for putting on this event. I think it's really great bringing everyone together and back in Lac Lou to share stories and memories. Um, I'm here because I was very uh, fortunate to be able to grow up on the original homestead um, of the Anderson family with my grandmother. Um, so I'm going to read a story that she submitted in this Black Blue Memories book. And I'll try and sub in some details that she might have not put in here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, Eric Anderson, my father-in-law, came here from Sweden in the 20s. I actually found some ship records that show him coming over a bit earlier, but either way, close enough. Um, previously, the land belonged to Vic Johnson. The Anderson family had a son, Gunnar, who was four years old when he came to Black Blue, and four daughters. They farmed and sold milk and eggs to the campers. All the children but one went to school here. The school teacher actually boarded with the family at that time, and Eric donated the land for the church that's pictured there and the schoolhouse that's pictured as well. Um, so she doesn't really talk about how, my grandma didn't talk in the story about how she ended up here, but she, I like, just put this together from your story, Rhonda. She was actually a child of Annie and Isidore from Berkland. Um, and she was working at the Kenrisha, where Julie Primrose and Eileen Crowley, I don't know her maiden name, were working at that time. And they became friends, and I'm assuming um, at maybe one of the Lacklu dances, she was invited out and met Gunnar. Anderson, who was Eric's son. Um, so they were married here in 1947. Um, they were given the original house, the white farmhouse that's actually still standing uh, in between School Road and Church Road. Um, and yeah, they built a little red, red house beside that where Eric and Christina moved into and Gunnar and Ruby stayed in the white house. Um, from there, they, they had the farmland but separated it out and sold a lot of property, developed it for, for cabins and created cabins for family members, which uh, 
resulted in, in a lot of our family coming here every summer and, and spending a lot of time there. Um, so yeah, they lived here until 1960 and through Gunner's job, which was the CPR, they were transferred to Regina, Saskatchewan. After a couple of years, they were transferred back to Kenora. Um, my dad told me at that time they couldn't actually move back to Lackloo because my grandfather was a, a roadmaster on the railway and he couldn't have a party line. So they had to move into Kenora where he could have his own dedicated phone line in case anything were to happen on the railroad. Um, yeah, then they were transferred to Kenora or to Winnipeg for 20 years. Um, my grandfather Gunnar passed away in 1980 and my grandmother came back here to live full time. Um, she has two boys, Brian, who is married and in Vancouver, Randy, who is my dad, is married in Edmonton, uh, where I was born, and Nancy, who is married with um, two boys, and at this time we're living in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, but they owned a house in Lakhlu and raised their boys here as well. So, um, yeah, that, that was pretty much it. My uh, gunner had... Um, Four sisters, Hilder, Betty, Norma, and Esther, and they all lived in the area, and Norma actually still lives in Kenora. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll get it right this time, uh, Wally. Wally's going to be talking a little bit about Buster son, and, son, and I think his family. Yeah, my dad, uh, Victor, was born in Ed, Sweden, and arrived in Canada in 1911 with family, traveled to Whitemouth, where he settled for a short time, then Ingolf, and then moved to Osterson, where he was promoted to section foreman for the CPR. At that time, section crews were responsible for completely maintaining four miles of track. The section house was located in a unique location between two railroad tracks. The eastbound was close to the home, the other was westbound, and it was located about a block away and was approximately 100 feet higher at that location. At that time, there was a station named Osterson and a post office, which was later changed to Lac Blue sometime in the 1930s. Osterson was a flagstop for the mixed train or local which it was sometimes called. The train was scheduled to run three times a week between Kenora and Winnipeg. A flag was placed close to the tracks to get notice to the engine to stop for passengers or freight. The train consisted of some freight cars, a coach car, which was half for baggage, the other half for passengers. The passenger part portion was heated with a coal stove. No steam was available. To obtain, to obtain groceries, it was preferable to travel by train to Kiwain or Kenora, as the usual travel was by horse and wagon in those days. Section houses were heated with wood stove in the kitchen, wood stove in the living room, kerosene lamps were utilized at night. There was no electricity, no running water. Outside Bethany, as somebody mentioned here earlier, the section crews brought water to the home. Section gangs had a hard job. They had to look for broken rails, washouts, changing ties, switches had to be cleaned of snow and ice so running trades could take siding or set off cars and siding or spur. Switch lamps had to be cleaned. Kerosene lamps had to be cleaned as well. They covered their territory with a hand car or jigger, as some call it. It was a hand pumped, hard work, in the summer, cold, exhausting work in the winter. One is located at Norman Railroad Museum. We also have one at our resort. They had to ride in the open, no heat in the winter, no air conditioning in the summer, rain, snow, stormy weather, they traveled in the open. The majority of the tools were carried on the hand cars, spike puller, hammers, brooms, shovels, the section crew consisted of a foreman and two, three, two to three men. Winter was extremely a difficult time. They were called out at night to, for derailments or required for track repairs and so on. Later, the family moved to Ingolf, where he was responsible for maintaining track Ingolf to Cross Lake. 
now known as Caddy Lake. At Ingolf there is no hydro. Several of the households had ice house where ice blocks were harvested in the winter and placed in these ice houses and then covered with sawdust, which kept the ice available for the summer season. Dad was fortunate enough to have a job during the Depression years to support the large family. Besides myself and my mom, there was Esther, Margaret, Alfred, and Oscar. During this period, there were four passenger trains in each direction. And in the summer, the camper special ran Friday out of Winnipeg evenings, Saturday afternoons, and a Sunday special returning from Kenora Sunday evening with all the campers. A lot of the passengers were CPR employees, so they traveled free of charge. Later, Dad and family moved to Kenora, where he was section foreman, snowplow foreman for the area covering Kenora to Molson. Snowplows were required when they're to plow the snow and those were the days as a steam engine. Dad worked hard and felt the CPR appreciated that loyalty. My summers as a youth was spent in Osterson with my grandparents and Andrew, Andrew and Constant Aunt Ibsen. They had a small farm located on the north side of Lake Lulu, Osterson Road. They arrived in the area in 1907 while well, the property was the Virgin Forest. They built a home with logs. The remainder, of the, the remainder of the material had to be shipped in from Kenora by CPR and then taken across the lake to the property, which was no easy task. They endured a lot of hardship during their lifetime. They raised chickens, hogs, and also milking cows. They had two barns, one for horse, the other for cattle, as well as a summer barn. Hay had to be cut and stored in the hay shed, usually adjacent to the barn. A chicken coop was located close by. Grain crops were usually barley, oats, and wheat. They had to be stooped and when ripe, and then a thrashing machine was hired to process the same. They had a large garden, so they grew potatoes, other vegetables stored for the winter in cellars. Pickling fruit preserves were done in the fall for winter use. My grandfather built a number of cottages for summer residents. As well, he built many flat-bottom rowboats, which he had sold. At the time, milk and eggs were sold to cottagers on Lake Lula. In the summer, Grandfather would go to web store by boat. He would roll across Rice Bay for mail, mail and groceries. Webs handled groceries, post office, sold gas, had a dance hall where many dances were held on a regular basis. Webs also had a water taxi service to meet the passenger trains and assisted guests to the cottages. There was, the regattas were a great summer event and was well attended. The settlement around Osterson Paulette were settled by many Scandinavians. Some of them I remember were Johnsons, Andersons, Gilbertsons, Hendricksons, Schroeders, Pearsons, Olsons, Lunds, Carlsons, Sundanes, Cedarwalls, Edisons, many others, can't remember them all. Scandinavians came here looking for a better life for themselves and their families. They endured many hardships, but they overcame the obstacles. They built the friendships, but most importantly, they built a community and legacy that lives today. We cannot forget where we came from and what we owe to those who came before us. That is why we are here today, so important. It allows us to reflect on who we are and realize the fact that each of us carries within us that obligation to never forget our heritage and culture. To some talk for listening. and talk till they oxo. And we now have uh, Heather Chaplin speaking about the Lundin family. Hi there. Yes, I'm Heather Lundin and um, actually I didn't volunteer for this. I just <laughs> I just emailed the organizers for an extra ticket and no sooner was I on the agenda. So uh, <laughs> Delcy was hard to say no to uh, over the telephone. She's, uh, she's very sweet. Anyway, um, before I tell you a bit about my family, let me tell you how Delcy and I ended up having an extended email exchange um, about something totally different. Um, I live in Calgary, and I have a friend uh, there whose parents grew up in Sprague, Manitoba. His name is Curtis Olson. And Delcy's last name was Olson. 
um, but I found out that they're not related. But she did mention that she grew up in Sprague, Manitoba as well. So I, just on a whim, I said, hey, Delcy, do you, do you happen to know the, the last names of my, my friends' families? I, I know they moved out of Sprague like in the 1950s, but you know, maybe you recognize the name. And well, it turns out that Delcy and my friend's mom, Teresa, grew up together. And Delcy was even one of her bridesmaids at her wedding. So <laughs> it's just amazing how Swedish people are connected around, you know, around the country. Um, and Delcy and Teresa keep in touch regularly by phone. And so that's one more story to support the, the theory that we're, we're, we're only uh, separated by six degrees of separation, and sometimes even less. Anyway, I'm here today with my father, Ron Landin and my mother, Marty, and also here is my sister, Janet, and my uh, eight of my totally awesome cousins. They're the, the giddy, rowdy ones over there. <laughs> and it's my, my father's side of the family that has Swedish roots in Kenora, and our story isn't necessarily any different or more special than any of your stories, but uh, I'll, I'll let you know about our family story, um, and you'll probably I'll recognize some, some things, and I've also recognized some things that uh, the other people have talked about, uh, about the hardships and the, and the kind of lifestyle that we, we've heard about. Um, but our story ba dates back to 1886, with uh, our great -grand uh, my, my great-grandfather's arrival in what was then Rat Portage. His name was Abraham Boreason, and he was from Grimmered, Sweden, which is about 85 kilometers south of Gothenburg and excuse my accent. Abraham was apparently a carpenter and he came to scope out the Rat Portage area shortly after the railroad had been finished and at a time when there was a bit of a gold rush going on here and the lumber industry was just getting started. At that time, the population of Rat Portage was 750 people and just six years earlier, according to the Lake of the Woods Museum historical timeline, Rat Portage was... Um, considered the roughest town in Canada. <laughs> At that point in time, I think any of us would probably email back home and say, don't come, I don't think you'll like it. <laughs> but anyway, a, sh a short time later, his wife did come with her, uh, their two kids in tow, and um, her name was Inga Kaiser Borja's daughter. And um, just as a lot of your family did, they chose uh, to shorten their name, to ang anglicize their name, um, so they chose Bergeson, and it, it gradually changed from Borgeson to Bergeson. But uh, anyway, after they came to Canada, my grandmother was born. She was the first in their family to be born in, in Canada in Rat Portage, and she was born in 1893. And Kenora was quickly being civilized and, and growing, and Rat Portage changed its name to Kenora in 1905. So. That's kind of where my, my father's father comes into play. In 1907, um, my grandfather, Nils Victor Landin, who was Nils Victor Augustson, but because uh, they changed their name and had to uh, keep one name for the whole family, similar to Cookie Wicks, they chose the name of the estate that they were farming in Sweden. So his, their, our family name is Landin now. So he hopped on the Empress of Ireland ship and immigrated to Kenora as a single guy from the area called Piatrid, and that's in Småland, uh, very near Elmholt. And um, over the last few years, I've been tinkering on Ancestry.ca, uh, as probably a lot of you are, but um, um, in the 1911 Kenora census, Victor was listed as a lumberman and millhand, and he was lodging at the home of a Carlson family. And when I looked a little closer a couple of weeks ago, I noticed that our grandmother was also lodging there at that same home, and her, na her name was Esther Bergeson. So it's probably not a stretch to conclude that that's where the two of them met and struck up a relationship. And they were married a year later in 1912. And they went on to have nine children, Agnes, Sally, Hilding, Stan, Evelyn, Helen, Esther, Ron, and Shirley. So our grandfather, Vic Lundin, was a tall man, and he had large working hands, and he was, he was known to be a kind and generous fellow, 
And he often set up tables on his lawn to provide meals for new Swedish immigrants. And he helped them settle into their new Kanara community. And he would often send cash back to his family in Elmholt, Sweden, but unfortunately he never had an opportunity to return there for a visit. Our grandmother, Esther Lundin, was heavily involved in the Bethesda Lutheran Women's Group uh, while raising her large family, and the Lundins belonged to the local Vasa Lodge, as did many other Swedish Kanara residents. And for many years when I was growing up, and my cousins, um, our extended family would have the really good fortune of renting the Vasa Hall every Christmas Eve. And so all 34 of our family members would gather at the hall and we would decorate a Christmas tree, we would cook a full uh, Christmas dinner in the kitchen, and, uh, and we would exchange presents. Well, actually, we didn't exchange presents. Santa actually came and delivered presents. And uh, it wasn't until like just a few years ago I was thinking, well, who was in the Santa suit? <laughs> And you may remember the name Gib McClay. I guess Gib McClay was a friend of the family, and he actually volunteered every Christmas Eve to dress up as Santa and deliver our presents. But anyway, so to wrap up, <laughs> I think it would be fair to say that your Swedish relatives and mine were brave, and they were strong of character, and they sought either a better life or a sense of adventure, or maybe both. And to leave their family home and usually never see them again, to learn a new language and to recreate a new life in Kenora must have been very challenging. So I know that, uh, that the Swedes of Kenora created a close community and relied on each other for support. And because of that, probably everybody in this room is connected somehow by less than six degrees of separation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Heather. We're running just about right on time, so it's working. Uh, we now have um, Joyce Apple, who will be speaking about, what was it, Joyce? Uh, Ear Falls. Right. <laughs> Hello. I'm Joyce Apple. I have a German last name, but I'm related to all the Englands and Westines of years past but it is a Kenora story that I've come to share with you. Down there, you will see a wedding certificate for Eric and Christina van Dam, who farmed here at La Clue years ago. That is not the story I come to tell you. It's the story of four Swedish woodsmen who made the first trip from Kenora to Winnipeg before the road was built. Before daybreak on December 27, 1927, these four cousins set out from Kenora with a Model T Ford at 18 degrees minus 18 degrees Celsius. This vehicle weighed 1,200 pounds with chains on its tires. With some manual labor, the men headed west to Winnipeg in early morning hours over Fox Lake and Shoal Lake with some travel on railway tracks, I'm told. The foursome arrived in the city at 3 o'clock the following day. This trip made headlines in the Kenora Minor and News on the 28th of December. Telegrams from mayors of Kenora and Winnipeg were received. Actually, the trip had been prearranged, so a letter from the Kenora Mayor, 85, was brought along. The four received a grand reception at City Hall where they were presented with the key to the city and a banquet, a buffalo banquet, I'm told. 
Next day, the visit to the Ford Motor Company and registered as guests at the Kenora, uh, sorry, Manitoba Tourism Bureau. And the next day, they headed the same route back to Kenora. It would be five years before the actual highway would be built. So, when the tough got going, the tough got going. And in the language of today, I can hear those four Swedes say, let's get her done. Thank you so much for bringing that to us. Every story was different. Everybody, everybody had something different to add, as, as is normal. Uh, is Vernon Silver here by any chance? No? Okay. Then, uh, does anybody else have a short story they would like to tell? No? We just have a couple of minutes. And you are? Audrey Larson. I live around here. <laughs> I'm just giving you a past idea of the property around here as it was grown. My uh, Sunday family started out on, um, on, the, on the east end here and they, they had a big lumber yard and they sold lumber to all over and they sold lumber to uh, Mather Wall's house and uh, flour mill and other big houses in Kuwait and in the winter they hauled it by lake in the summer by an old truck road. They, my dad was Alfred Sundin and uh, then my mother's name was Lempy Hendrickson and she lived in the, on the property that was next to Eric, Eric Anderson's and so they met and married and uh, then after they done, sold the lumber and they had two floods and the lumber flooded all over and finally they shut it down and the generators broke up and then they and then I met uh, Gunner and Ruby or uh, Isidore and Annie's uh, son Lorne and we got married and then we lived in Whitman's house, which was down the road. But at Whitman's, years ago, there was a big dance hall there. And many people would go in there on a Saturday night and dance. And they wouldn't get home till the next day. And that was a big party. And then when my husband and I got married, we uh, lived at Whitman's house. Then the Andersons, uh, Ruby Anderson is, is my mother-in-law and Gunner and Gunner, uh, uh, didn't, she, uh, Brandy didn't say that uh, uh, Eric Anderson donated the church property to the Lutheran Church for free and it's, now it is a house and when my husband and I got a uh, property my dad had a lot of property uh, or my mother did well, the Hendrickson farm extended from right beside the Erickson and, uh, er, yeah, uh, farm. And my grandmother donated a piece of the property to the uh, school, the plant school. Little did they know until it was surveyed later that she had donated part of the, er, the Anderson property. So it was split in half. Then my mother's family, they just grew potatoes, and my grandfather died very early. And I almost drowned in that property one time. I was sliding and went in the lake and under an ice hole, and I popped up. I had a big hat on my head, and I slid down right in. I looked around, it's all green. I thought, oh, I'll push my leg. Flew up, ran up the hill. My mother came and gave me a licking. Oh, God. So then the Sundines, 
Uh, I, the Larsons, my, my dad bought, my mother bought the property that uh, Cheryl and Harry Favreau live on, and my, we lived there, and we got a piece of property, and that end of the property ended up by the pipeline. So there's a little thing of how the property got around. That's it. Thank you. Karen, did you have something to say? Short. Just breathe, please. Very short. Very short. I'm Karen Chadine Marchant. Um, our story is a little bit different. That our grandfather came from Sweden, never acknowledged anything about Sweden. When our sister Linda passed away about five years ago, we had a cousin call from Sweden, wondering if we're related, which we are. Our grandfather had 11 family members, brothers and sisters in his family, but never talked or spoke of them. And uh, now what else? <laughs> but my mom and dad, he would, my dad was the only child, in, only Shadeen child, and they had seven children. So all of us are still here and going strong. Yeah. So it's <laughs> I'd just like to thank all the speakers. It isn't easy for people to do that, although some people seem quite at home. At, and uh, it was nice to hear all the stories. I hope you enjoyed them and do enjoy the rest of the day.